Despite claiming they were low on ammunition and about to withdraw from Bakhmut, Wagner troops launched a massive all-out attack in a last-ditch effort to seize Bakhmut before Victory Day on May 9th. Rhetoric continues to escalate over the drone strikes on the Kremlin, a very dangerous situation for all parties involved. Meanwhile, Russia has begun evacuating dozens of towns and cities in occupied Zaporozhye region as a counterattack is expected to begin imminently, and the first Bradley fighting vehicles have been spotted moving to the front line in Ukraine. All of this in today's Frontline Report. What's up, nerds? This is New World Economics War Reports with the 6th of May 2023 frontline report for the Russo-Ukrainian War. Please consider hitting both that like and subscribe button. Clicks that are so easy and free for you, but are a big help for me to grow the channel. Also consider hitting that bell icon so you do not mix the next update. A couple of days ago, I gave you guys an update on the situation in Moscow with the drone strikes on the Kremlin, and I want to clarify some things. I was accused in the comments of intentionally leaving out some details. I assure you, at the time, I had not yet come across this information, but apparently Ukrainian President Zelensky was actually in Finland at the time of the strikes and had made some public statements about the event, along with a change in his travel itinerary, which I assume uh, this was probably out of concern that the Russians might retaliate against him directly, perhaps, um, if they knew where he was. There's also some information about uh, his plans to visit Germany today being leaked and, and him being upset over that. We don't attack Putin or Moscow uh, we fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. We don't have, you know, enough weapon for this. That's why we don't use it any, anywhere. For, for us, that is the deficit. We, we can't spend it. And we didn't attack Putin. We leave it to tribunal. This drone attack on the Kremlin is such a huge event and a huge story, so I think it is important to take a look at what the mainstream media is saying about it. Even though many of you come to my channel exactly because I am not the mainstream media, I understand that, but it is undeniable that the headlines and the summary of these articles are a huge driver of public opinion, so let's see what the political narrative is in the Western world. From the conservative perspective, this is a decent summary of the situation. Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, is saying that they view the drone incident as a hostile act. This type of headline should bring about some concern for the average reader, because it is concerning. However you feel about the Ukraine war, Russia and the U.S. are nuclear powers. The U.S. is arming Ukraine to fight Russia. Yes, Russia started the war, but this is a potential clash of titans. We must tread carefully. I think these headlines somewhat reflect that concern. And yes, in terms of World War III, it does matter what the Russians are saying publicly. Hopefully, the average reader sees this and thinks, Wow, I hope our national leaders work to seriously convince the Russians we had nothing to do with this. Whether we did or not. After all, it could save the world. Since we live in a democracy, information that influences the average voter will trickle up to the leadership and have an effect on the decision-making process. But look, only 13% of the media outlets reporting the story in this manner are from the left-leaning side. This is a good reason why your teenage and young adult kids are not understanding this perspective. They are not seeing much official reporting from the perspective. I think that there is an argument that this blind spot in the public opinion is a concern. Now, from the left-leaning media, Zelensky wants Putin trial, Russia accuses U.S. on drones. Ukraine and Russia pressed their wartime rhetoric Thursday, with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky expressing confidence that Vladimir Putin would be convicted of war crimes, and the Kremlin alleging that the U.S. was behind what it called an assassination attempt against the Russian president. Now, while this is technically all true, I think this just sends the wrong message to the average reader. It gives the idea that most important takeaway from the situation is still that Russia and their national leader 
are criminals. Since in the same breath we are also talking about an assassination attempt on Putin himself, in my view, this is basically a low-key justification. They are essentially saying, yes, there was an attempt on Putin's life, but that doesn't as matter as much because he's still a war criminal. In my opinion, this is a very, very dangerous way to view the situation. This is a hawkish perspective, and it's the main opinion and headline that is running in front of the eyes of people who lean left politically. This is also the primary perspective of large media companies, which are pushing 44% of this type of coverage. So, these are the narratives being pushed to the average Western citizen. If you want access to information like this for yourself, please consider visiting Ground News and make your own assessment. Only Ground News has features like the bias distribution, ownership that tells you the money behind the articles, and of course the best feature, Blind Spot, which tells you the stories that have had the worst partisan coverage. Noting, knowing your media bias is so important. 81% of Americans believe news is very important to democracy, yet 86% of Americans see a fair amount of bias in news coverage. If you are looking for a great way to help support the channel, please consider visiting Ground News and sign up for free or get 30% off on a Vantage membership where you have access to all the best features that I find most useful. A huge thank you to Ground News for sponsoring this video. All right, moving on to the biggest news, the situation in Bakhmut. There was a massive bombardment of the western part of the city through the night. The Russians threw basically everything they had at the Ukrainians, including incendiary multiple launch rockets along with thermobaric missiles. The bombardment was devastating and also paired with an all-out attack along the entire front. Wagner troops are attempting to break through near Kromova and Ivanivsky on the flanks and in an attempt to completely surround the remaining Ukrainian forces. This is also supported by a storming of the high-rise district in the center that the Russians are now calling the Nest and the remaining residential blocks to the north. Early reports suggest that the Ukrainians have forced have been forced back from the road of life leading into Hromova and lost some ground in the residential area. As of this moment, the battle is still ongoing and it's tough to say anything definitive. This attack was certainly part of an effort to seize Bakhmut before Victory Day. If achieved, this would be a symbolic act and a moral booster for the Russian troops and the Russian public. I would like to stress that this that the battle is not yet over and the Ukrainians have not yet shown any sign of retreating from the city. Moving to the Zaporozhye front, we are starting to get more and more signs that a Ukrainian attack is manifesting. The Russian army has decided to evacuate dozens of towns in the region. There are many reasons for doing this. First off, according to the Geneva Convention, governments are obliged to remove civilian populations from war zones. Now, this is cited very often, and I will say it is a very vague international law, as it does not get specific on how close to the front line uh, civilians can be. Uh, so... Really, war zone is just a broad definition. It could either mean all of Ukraine or the final one kilometer leading up to the trenches. Other reasons for moving the population could be to reduce the oppor opportunities for Ukrainian intelligence gathering uh, rather drastically, as well as using civilian residences to house military personnel, essentially confiscating property for military purposes. In general, it is easier for a military force to operate without civilian traffic on the roads getting in the way. So this is potentially one big sign that um, the Russians are expecting major Ukrainian activity in the area. The first Bradley fight, fighting vehicles have been spotted somewhere in Ukraine. There was a column of these vehicles moving down the highway, all loaded up with infantry riding on top of the vehicles. Now, from the footage, allegedly this took place in eastern Ukraine, but there are two takeaways here. Either these vehicles are close to the front line, 
shuttling troops around for combat operations, or they are in western Ukraine conducting drills. There is some civilian traffic seen on the road, but that isn't really an indicator of where these vehicles are, as there are still civilians in eastern Ukraine. The Ukrainian military has also been known to use civilian vehicles just like the Russian military. I believe the Bradleys will likely make up the main offensive fist of the Ukrainian strike force. Of all of the vehicles donated to Ukraine from NATO for the offensive, the Bradley is the most versatile and the most useful. I am not entirely convinced the German Leopard 2 tanks will be a game changer, but the Bradley outclasses all I other IFVs, that's infantry fighting vehicles, on the battlefield and has a significant anti-tank capability as well. In summary, it's a shit ton of firepower all packed into an angry little box with tracks on it. I do not believe the Russians will be caught off guard by the Ukrainian offensive. Recently, video surfaced of Sergei Shoigu allegedly visiting the southern military district in the region of Rostov-on-Don to check combat readiness. In the video footage released, you can see dozens of modern Russian T-90 main battle tanks lined up and hundreds of other armored vehicles. It is important to note that this is just one location in the rear along hundreds of kilometers of front line. It is easy to forget just before the new year, Russia mobilized 300,000 reservists into the army, and the vast majority of the heavy fighting through the winter campaign was carried out by Russian army specialists. In Bakhmut, the fighting was primarily Wagner mercenaries with hordes of prisoner recruits. In Kremina, VDV Airborne carried out the fighting in the forests. In Avdivka, the main assaults have been led by militia formations fighting since 2014. And even the failure of Ugladar, it was carried out by naval infantry, essentially Russian marines. All of these groups were primarily made up of volunteer forces. Sure, there were likely some conscripts involved, but it is safe to assume the Russians, as predicted by many military analysts, are entering into the summer conflict with close to half a million manpower. If you want to know more about my predictions of the Ukrainian offensive, please check out the video I posted last night. I put it up a little late, so I know many of you didn't see it. You can click on the card here. Finally, we will take a look at the overall battlefield to see where each side has been conducting assault operations. Most of the fighting is taking place in the Bakhmut domain with some sporadic reports of Ukrainian probing attacks in other areas of the front line. Thank you guys for watching and until next time.